This story is about a house in Silver City, New Mexico, but it's also about a man, John Pickrell Risk, who once lived in it, and about the community of which he was a pioneer citizen. The house is one of the oldest in Silver City. We don't know when it was built, but we know it was there in 1877, before the town was chartered. Silver City has grown and changed a lot since then and John Risk's house has changed with it. Recently, this house was one of four chosen by GRIP, the Gila Resources Information Project, to be shown in a tour of houses that exhibit green features, and it was the only old house of the four. We were excited to select your house because we wanted to, to uh, talk about the wonderful features that already are exhibited here in Silver City and other southwestern communities in terms of adobe houses. Some, I know people think that they're historically interesting, but we think that they're, they have a lot of sustainable features that are, are sometimes overlooked by builders now. Definitely the adobe walls and the fact that it, it, that it faces south and so it has the opportunity to, to, for solar gain. Um, it's built with these transoms above the door so that the heat moves from room to room because the fireplace was the central heating and so therefore the heat moves well. I think you have um, the eastern exposure for early sun. There's uh, uh, The house appears to be built very low to the ground which mm -hmm. has a cooling effect. The story of this house shows us something about how dwellings in the Southwest can be green, can be designed and sited to fit their surroundings, can be built using locally available materials, can be comfortable to live in, and sparing in their consumption of energy. And in looking at all of this, we shall follow the short and tragic career of John P. Risk. In the years following the Civil War, the American Southwest began to attract settlers from the East. It was a beautiful but forbidding land, mountainous, much of it dry and barren, and mostly without roads. But it certainly had one great attraction. It was full of valuable minerals. Copper was found, often occurring native in large clusters, and there were important gold and silver. Droves of Easterners began showing up, prospectors, miners, and soon ranchers and homesteaders. All this was happening on the ancestral lands of the indigenous people, especially the Apaches, a mobile warlike super tribe, expert horsemen and raiders whom the newly arrived settlers quickly learned to fear and respect. In the southwestern corner of New Mexico and the surrounding area, the great Apache leaders, Geronimo, Cochise, Naiche, and Victorio held sway. Clashes had to happen. The Native Americans wanted to keep the country of their fathers, while the new settlers thought it was their manifest destiny to occupy the West and especially to acquire its mineral wealth. The blood-soaked story of what we call the Indian Wars was unfolding. It's a long way from Georgetown, D.C. to Georgetown, New Mexico, and it must have seemed even longer in the 1870s when young John Risk, a native of the one, came to the other. Georgetown had sprung up around a rich silver strike, and John set up an office there as an assayer. We don't know how long he stayed in Georgetown, but in 1877, he showed up in Silver City, another town born from a silver strike. By that time, he had a law degree and was married to a St. Louis debutante named Jenny. The couple had a young son. They called him Jack though his full name was the same as his father's. John opened a law office in Silver City in partnership with Thomas Frederick Conway. John's background gave him a sort of instant status in the raw young city. 
As a professional person coming into the town as an attorney, he would have been one of the more educated people, um, more powerfully connected to other parts of, uh, of New Mexico, and uh, someone who was in a position to make things happen. He was active in civic affairs. The minutes of the city council record his election to the school board in April of 1882. In 1878, the Risks bought a house on what is now 102 West Kelly Street, though it fronted on Bullard then. That was the northern edge of town in those days. Their house was probably the only residence on the block. Silver City was just beginning to take form. Well, in the 1870s, Silver City was a brand new community. It had been named Silver City, was just getting started. And uh, so there were many amenities uh, that we have today that weren't present. Of course, the streets were not paved, but the blocks were very carefully laid out in a nice grid pattern um, that wasn't necessarily uh, practical in the Southwest, but it, it reflected that the town uh, fathers wanted to be formal about it, to have a town that would be around in a hundred years. Uh, at that point, I don't know that they were thinking about preservation so much as just um, surviving in their own uh, lives, but um, they brought a combination of uh, techniques and, and um, preferences from their lives elsewhere uh, in terms of architectural styles and that sort of thing. Uh, along with blending in with tr traditional Southwest techniques and preferences like uh, building from adobe. It was a very practical and um, substantial way to build in those days. Other dwellings soon appeared on the block where the risk lived, and a number of them survived today. The Italianate Isaac Cohen House went up in 1882. Next door to it, at about the same time, the Swift House was built, though only the later rear addition to it, much remodeled, survives today. Dr. White, a dentist, built an office on Bullard in 1887, and a bit later built a house next door to it. On the corner of Texas and 6th Street stands a house that was originally the barn belonging to the Swifts. In 1913, Mrs. Swift, who was by then a widow, had it remodeled into a dwelling for renting. The work was done by that remarkable Silver City contractor, Elizabeth Warren, whose name is still to be seen on a number of sidewalks, which she also built around town. Finally, in that same year of 1913, the house on the corner of Texas and Kelly was constructed, or actually enlarged from an adobe shack, which was originally a wood storage shed and may have been as old as the Risk House. I live in the John Risk house now, and I'd like to show you what we think the original structure was like and some of the changes made by the Risks and later occupants. The floors were redone after I moved in, and during that reconstruction, we found out that the house had been built on an unusually good site, and we also found out which parts of it are the oldest. In the literally over a hundred houses I've been in in the Silver City downtown area all the way up to E Street paralleling Yankee Street they're all headed to the big ditch there's a there's a clay seam down there somewhere I can't tell you if it's 10 feet down or 70 feet down but it's everything is moving downhill and people who own houses on E Street D C, B, A Street are all looking at their downhill foundation and saying it's pulling away from the wall. It's probably been doing that for as long as the house was built. Was there. And, yes, and, and this house fortunately didn't move any because it's literally on granite. Remember that we found the, the, the original room of the house. When we were doing our excavations, while we were digging out this excess dirt, we got down to one of the original rubble foundations and you could see the threshold of the original the front door. Oh my goodness. The front door was right here. And you could see where the door had been and the, the next owner or the modifier 
left that right where it was and built right over the top of it with the second room. Under the flooring, we found a few relics that had been lying there for more than a century, a tin plate, a broken mason's hammer, and a number of bones that may have been those of an elk. Notice how deeply the dirt has been excavated below this part of the floor. This earth was probably used to make the very adobes from which the wall was constructed, a sensible economical style of building that's been used in the Southwest for centuries. When the risks extended the house toward the east, they added an interesting feature. And it pushed out into the, to one of the only bay windows to the east that, uh, that I've seen in, in downtown Silver City. There very well may be several others, but this one is intact with its original woodwork. And remember and, how wide those planks are? The, the, planks, the planks in the, the um, woodwork that's exposed in the bay window are unusually wide for the Silver City area. The bay window originally looked out on a vacant expanse to the east. Its southeast facing wing caught the early morning sun during the cold months. And by the way, the ancient Indian hut dwellers of this region did exactly the same thing. Their houses were often built with an opening to the southeast to catch early morning winter sun. So designing a house to make it energy efficient is a very old idea. It went out of fashion in the era of cheap energy but now it's coming into its own again in Silver City and in other places as well. We were hearing from not only home builders but architects and the designers of homes and builders that there's an increased interest as the demographics change or as people understand more about the concepts of building and as the utility bills go up. Uh, it's just there's more information I think across the board about the, uh, the, the benefits of building in a different way. Than, um, than we'd seen previously in sort of the boom of you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s when there was a lot of frame housing going up and building changed, high vaulted ceilings. So. In the new room, the Risks built a fireplace that was efficient in several ways. For one thing, its small front opening and shallow front to back dimensions improved its draft and minimized smoking. In fact, it was a sort of southwestern version of the famous Rumford fireplace that had been invented in the 1790s. Then there was the location of the fireplace and chimney, close to the center of the house, which not only makes it draw better, but also puts more of its heat where it's needed. And then there are the eyebrow windows in the interior walls making it possible for heated air from the fireplace to pass into other rooms. Notice the thickness of those walls. That's very different from the thin plasterboard interior walls of most modern houses. Those adobe walls provide thermal mass that helps to stabilize the temperature indoors. When the fireplace has been going for a while, you can put your hand on any of the nearby interior walls and feel the accumulated warmth. And, by the same token, these walls help the house to keep cool in the summer weather. I try to help the cooling by growing a shade plant, like morning glories, on my south-facing wall every summer. We saw something about how the risks had enlarged the house after they moved in. In fact, we think the original house may have been a two-room affair comprising this, the dining room, and a kitchen. But later additions have resulted in a 1,200-square-foot house. That's still not huge, but it's more than adequate. And the rooms have a cozy feel to them that I like. Come with me on a brief tour. We're looking at the front parlor with its bay window and the fireplace and flowing into it is the dining room, one of the original rooms of the house. We have to step up into the kitchen. I like to keep one of my aquariums in here. If we exit the kitchen to the east, we see the bedroom.
If we go out the other room of the kitchen, we'll be in the computer room, and beyond that to the west, the bathroom. A south door from the computer room leads to the television studio, where among many other things, I keep several aquariums. The back door of the computer room opens into the garden. Water harvested from the roof, plus gray water, creates a tiny green oasis behind the house. My cat Pearl likes to be outdoors, but she has a bad habit of running away. I've set up a system that seems to satisfy both of us. A tunnel from the window of the computer room leads to an enclosed area where my cat can enjoy the outdoors, but cannot roam off or eat songbirds. From earliest days, Silver City has had a love-hate relationship with water. Our area is semi-desert with marginal rainfall, even in normal times. And on top of that, there are periodic droughts. We've been in one for the past decade so water is a precious commodity. When the Risks lived here, there was no city water supply. That was not to come until the late 1880s. A few people had wells. The Risk near neighbor Isaac Cohen had one, which is still to be seen on the back porch of the house where he lived. But as far as we know, the Risks had no well. We're told they preserved water by a cistern located underground in what is now a neighbor's yard, though it was then part of the Risk property. The water was most likely collected as runoff from the roof of the house. If the cistern were still available, we might be able to collect it in the same way now. Today in the Risk house, I'm using the city water supply but I tried to do a bit of recycling by emptying my bathtub through a hose onto the garden in the backyard. And the little incremental things that we can do to change our lives in ways, it's really a matter of just changing habits as much as anything else, I think. I, I lived without running water for a while and when I was younger, and that really taught me to really appreciate conserve it. water and appreciate what I had. And, um, and I, I, I just think that people are getting that mindset now, and it's really, uh, it's very inspiring to see. The whole concept of reduce, reuse, and recycle can't be stressed enough. To me, I, I really believe that uh, I hate to see anything go to the dump myself. <laughs> Here's the other side of the water paradox in Silver City. When the rains do come, and that's usually in the late summer, they can turn the streets into rivers. They can do heavy damage to buildings, and especially to exposed adobe, which washes away very badly unless it is protected from rain. And the part of an adobe wall that is most vulnerable is the lowest course, which rain can undercut badly. In the 1870s, there was not only this problem for the risks in their adobe house, there was also frequent flooding in the downtown area where they lived. The first flood of, of uh, major proportions that I've read about is um, in 1875. And um, at that time, floods weren't just in Main Street. They were throughout the downtown area. Mm -hmm. And as early as 1875, 76, people were already beginning to wonder if they had placed the town in the right location. Mm -hmm. And so the, the citizens of the town grew so accustomed to having floods that it didn't strike them as a little strange that they had this natural disaster every single year. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as the years went by, they had more than one of them. So many floods that uh, by the 1890s, they no longer talked about the rainy season, they talked about the flood season. Mm -hmm. Soon after John and Jenny moved in, they took two measures to protect their property. The newspaper is a very good source for a lot of information about buildings because 
you didn't have to uh, do anything very dramatic to make it into the papers in those days. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating when um, not every bit of news that you wish had been reported is reported, but um, in the case of this house, we did learn two things about it. One, um, 1879, uh, the house was being plastered, which means that prior to that time, very likely, it was just bare adobe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1880, a substantial rock wall was being built around John Risk's property on Bullard, is how they described it. In the background of this photograph, taken about 1910, the east end of the Risk house is visible. Notice that bay window. Running off to the right, you can see the low wall, which extended in the downhill direction toward the often flooded Bullard Street. Its likely purpose was to keep the lower part of the yard from washing away. Floods continued to plague Silver City until the 1930s when diversion dams were constructed by the CCC. Besides direct erosion, water can damage buildings in other ways. It can creep under foundations and damage floors. That had happened to the Risk House, and after I moved in, I had to have something done about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this room, when we tore this room out, it was dug fur over two befores, and the two befores <laughs> were literally lying on the dirt. And there was no fixing that. And when, here again, the same thing. We pulled everything out. We did not put a footing around it, but what we did do is we ran an eight inch flexible duct mm -hmm. all the way from the other room under, well underneath the, the concrete and up to the outside into a concrete banco. We, the banco, is, there's two and a half feet exposed to above the ground and there's four feet down below and it's solid concrete. And we did that with intent because of known water problems. And so I don't know if we fixed the problem, but we sure inhibited it. It, it no longer has the path of least resistance through your home. In any region, exposed wood on a structure creates a problem. And in the southwest, with so much strong sunlight, wood can weather very badly indeed, unless special measures are taken to protect it. There have been two traditional ways of doing this. Have you ever been to Winston and Chloride? I have, but it's been a while. Mr. Winston's carriage house in Winston is covered, all of the exterior wood on it is covered with that tin ceiling stuff. Yes. And you can peel it back, the wood is as new <laughs> as when it was, you know. I, I covered my front door with tin ceiling stuff. I have a good friend who got some old copper yeah. roofing from, oh, from a Santa Rita house and did his front door in it and it patinaed out beautiful. Oh, I'd love to see a picture it's, of it's that. It's gorgeous. It, it, it's, so it's, it's, it makes it, you grin yeah. because you can see that how much he's recycled into his home. And I want to do the same thing on my beautiful bay window because I have, I have carefully taken care of the wood on the inside of it, but that outside... Wood is hell in the southwest. I've even Just, put Bondo on it. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. I bet there's a lot of lead paint on there too. Yes, it probably so, is. I think abating it might be the right thing to do. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. The best thing you could do to exterior wood is paint it. Even if you have to keep repainting it yep. each? That's the best thing you can do. Paint it. I own this house, yet it's not entirely mine. Part of it will always belong to John Risk and his family and to the others who have lived here before me. Over the years, I've made changes, just as previous owners have done, beginning with John Risk himself. But I've always tried to remember and respect the character and history of a house that was here long before my time. I've tried to use materials that fit the style of this small green domicile and that will, if possible, last yet another century. We saw how John Risk had been elected to the school board in April 1882, but he was never to serve. Just a few weeks later, the council minutes note an election to fill a vacancy left by his death. On April 21st, 1882, John Risk was traveling with four other men when their party was attacked by Apaches seven miles south of Clifton, Arizona. 
Risk had gone there to examine a possible gold claim. Eyewitnesses tell us he was riding a mule and was second in the string of men descending to the Gila River when the Apaches appeared out of nowhere and fired upon the party of men. Risk took two bullets, one to the torso and one to the head. We may hope that he died quickly. His body was stripped of anything that could be sold or traded. The loot included a pair of silver cufflinks and a gold watch inscribed, John P. Risk, Silver City. The Apaches rode across the border into a Mexican village where they traded their loot for whiskey. The alcalde of the village saw the inscription on the watch. He returned the watch and cufflinks to Mayor Bennett of Silver City, who saw to it that they were returned to John's widow, Jenny. The cufflinks are still in the possession of the family. They're made from coins, 1856 quarters, reshaped and embossed with John's initials in blue enamel. John's body was eventually conveyed to St. Louis and buried in Bellefontaine Cemetery. John shares a headstone there with his son, who survived him by 61 years. Well, I hope your process of exploring the past of your house will inspire other people, because what really makes history interesting is the people and the stories. And not everybody has um, such a dramatic story as John Risk, but certainly their lives are interesting. Everyone's lives are interesting. And um, what people do with their houses, what they say with their houses, what kind of statement they make about themselves or, or their lives, uh, what kind of hopes are reflected in the buildings about what the future might be like, uh, those are all so significant. And um, I think the key word in preservation is respect. Uh, the preservation movement understands that life must go on, that people don't want to live in museum settings with no running water or whatever, um, that, that people need to adapt to the needs of their present day. No one's going to yank their internet connections out just to be historically authentic. But um, if they could respect what, what went before, and when they do uh, build or remodel or work on properties that are in historic districts, to do so in a respectful way that, that acknowledges that the other stuff was there first. And um, make their statement in a, in a quiet and personal way that doesn't overshadow the whole neighborhood that it's part of.